Part 2, Chapter 20 of If These Young Men by Romer Wilson. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Expatriate in Bangor, Maine. Part 2, London, Chapter 20, Chivalrous Encounter. It was the ninth of May and one of those cool evenings when it seems no season of the year. Blanchard and Susan came out of the old doorway of the house in which she lived and up in the top window Josephine stood and watched them cross the street and disappear round the corner. They went out to supper at Gotti's in the Strand, and afterwards for choice to a cinema show, and saw an American five-reel drama in which the characters were all millionaires with Japanese valets. Superb, Blanchard said at the sentimental crisis, but both of them were moved nevertheless, and when they came out Susan took his arm and he held her hand in his. I did enjoy that dance, said Susan, thinking of the last time they had gone out together. It was lovely. I must take you to some other dances, he replied. We have to have a member's ticket to get into ours. I must introduce you to the Lees. Yes, do, said Susan. I should like it so much. Quite, he answered. He did not understand why Susan would like it so much, however. It never occurred to him that she had not a thousand friends, nor that her circle of male acquaintances was limited. No sooner had he said quite than he felt that he would never take her to another dance or introduce her to the Lees or anybody else, because it seemed as if something were compelling him against his will to offer to take her about. He spoke again. He said quickly, You must marry somebody wonderful. Susan did not reply, and when they walked along in silence a little way, he repeated, You must marry some wonderful man. You mustn't let me spoil it. "'Spoil what?' cried Susan in the voice of fear. "'There aren't any wonderful men. They are all killed. "'And even if they were not, none of them would want to marry me.' "'I must keep out of the way,' went on Blanchard. "'I can't take you anywhere unless we are engaged to be married. "'I can't go about with you like that. I should ruin your chances.' "'What?' said Susan, angry because he seemed to be quite willfully blind to her idea that she had no chances to ruin. "'She was sure she had no chances to ruin.' I haven't any chances, she said. I don't know what you mean. Blanchard said, men are coarse brutes. I do not know why I could not harm you, but I could not do you any harm. You would not harm me by introducing me to some people, you know. I feel so cut off from you, James. It is dreadful. Blanchard walked on without speaking. In his simple mind, he did not know what to do or say. After a few minutes, he muttered, making another attempt to justify his will to keep her out of his life. My friends, you know, are chiefly misogynists. They don't require women. Lewis has his own woman, and... Yes, quite. I will ask you. Let me see. To dinner. I will ask Lewis. Let me see. I think I could ask him. Not to meet you ostensibly. And I might ask Dennis Grant. You know Dennis Grant? He is very exclusive. They don't go about to meet women. Susan was not offended at this ungallant speech. Susan was not in the least angry that the young men of her time had an attitude towards the young women which was not flattering. There were very few young men. In countries where women are scarce, the tables were turned, and men would go fifty miles to see a girl. She said, yes, do ask Lewis. I do so want to meet him. Quite, answered Blanchard, and began to feel a little relieved, as if he had fixed an evil day at an indefinite date in the future. Certainly it was not usual in his world to cumber oneself up with women, and he wished to live as much like the other men in the world he had chosen as he could. His friends said, A woman always puts an end to a party of good fellowship, and he said it too. The recollection of male parties faded, and he looked at Susan with a sudden realization of her goodness. He had never met anybody so good. He wished all at once to stand well with her and to keep a clean face outward to her. As he had wanted to prevent her intruding upon his world, so now he wanted to keep the world away from her. In a minute his wishes and fears vanished, and he was glad to be alone with her. How is Amaryllis, she said presently. You never tell me about her. You promised not to question me about her. Why shouldn't I? Why shouldn't I? cried Susan angrily. You are so shut away from me, James. I can't bear it. I promised, he went on, if I fell in love with anybody I would tell you. If you ask me any more about Amaryllis, I shall have to give up seeing you. I am very fond of Amaryllis. We are very good friends. I don't think you have any right to question me about her. I will tell you if I fall in love, as I have promised. But you must not question me. You have not the right. 
"'You needn't be so angry, James,' said Susan. "'I only asked you something quite simple. "'Oh, James, I am so miserable and lonely.' "'I am no use,' he said, beginning to look heavy and sorrowful. "'I have no heart.' They went upstairs into his rooms and sat down in the bare, dimly lighted sitting room, but they did not stop talking. "'That's it,' Blanchard said again, using his favorite expression. "'I have no heart.' "'I don't know what you mean,' said Susan sadly, with a sigh. Blanchard sat down on the arm of his chair and stared at the carpet. His face was relaxed, his mouth a little open, and he began fidgeting absent-mindedly with his pipe, which he had taken out to fill. "'That's it,' he murmured. "'I'm a blasé roué. I don't care for women. I wish I could marry you, Susan, but I am not in love with you. Perhaps I might fall in love with you after we were married. I wish I could marry you. I am missing something.' "'I am quite willing to marry you just as you are,' said Susan, simply and with dignity. "'You often say you could be happy with me.' "'Yes,' he said. "'I know I could be happy with you.' Blanchard continued to stare at the floor. "'We mustn't get emotional,' he murmured, and then sat there in silence. After a little while he filled his pipe and said, "'My mother brought me up to expect that I should have plenty of pretty girls as my right, but perhaps I am too old. I am twenty-seven. Perhaps I am too old.' Perhaps what Rupert Brooke said of himself is true for me. I can't really love wholeheartedly. We could be happy, cried Susan. Oh, James! Yes, he repeated. I know I could be happy with you. Susan did not at this point employ any of those arts which are commonly supposed to entrap the lover. She was innocent of the intuitive knowledge that most men and women have of snaring love, and if she had known what now to say, she would not have employed the necessary skill in saying it. She was at Blanchard's mercy. All he chose to express she took as truth. She was not quick to see the changing of his eyes or the new attitude of his mind behind the expression of his face. He began very timidly to put himself in her power. All his generous instincts were aroused and his heart was beating with a generous impulse. That fine feeling which comes over human beings when they take life into their hands and cast out judgment caused him to look up now at Susan. She sat back in her chair, sure that he did not love her, unable to speak one word or to sigh one sigh she thought he might not like. Life hedged her close in, down in a little corner, like a hare in a ditch resting a minute in its flight from the hounds. Blanchard had said, I cannot marry you. That was what she understood. She looked up and saw Blanchard standing above her. He put his hand on her shoulder and in a minute she was crying in his arms. Kind and tender feelings smote his heart, and welling upwards caused him to feel brave and chivalrous. He said in the voice of honest love, You have the key of my heart. What do you mean? cried Susan. I don't know what you mean. He became patient, and although his words lost their finest values, said again, You have the key of my heart. You can unlock it. She made no attempt at dissimulation. Dishonesty was entirely unknown to her. She had not the slightest comprehension of what he meant. I don't know what you mean, she cried piteously. Blanchard could not say any more. Perhaps he hardly knew what the key was himself. Some quick glimpse into the garden of paradise had perhaps shown him Susan with his happiness in her hands and had caused him to speak. Since he had nothing more to say, he went on kissing her. As he kissed her, she became aware that she ought to do or say something which she found beyond the power of her imagination. She was at attention. All that she could feel was that he was offering her himself in a fit of emotion, and that she could not take advantage of him. Thus they met in chivalrous encounter. A sense of loss came over Blanchard, as if a very fine offer had been refused, but he continued to hold Susan in his arms and to talk. Amaryllis is not as fine as we are. He felt as if Susan and himself had done something very fine and noble together. He went on, We mustn't meet often like this. It is not good for us to be so emotional. A crisis had taken place in his mind, but now that it was over, he had no definite idea of what it was, though it seemed as clear as glass and as sharp as a fine knife and as bright as a diamond. He wished for a minute to recapture his image of it and repeated, we are very fine, we are perhaps too fine, don't you think so? The possibility of experiencing again the lost moment was now quite gone, and he added, if you think it would be better not to see me any more. No, 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 cried Susan, it is all right, I must go on seeing you. 
the idea of not seeing you is simply intolerable she felt as if the world were giving way under her feet she did not in the least understand him he had just offered her the key of his heart and now suggested that they should not meet again what 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 have i missed she cried to herself and out loud immediately afterwards she said i don't understand james he had slowly disengaged himself from her and was standing up by the fireplace with his hands in his pockets staring at her as if she were the only person in the world after a few minutes silence she said i suppose i must be going it is late he suddenly felt that if she stayed with him forever he would marry her and love her and they would be happy he bit his lip the thought being in his mind to go over to her and stop her going away but he did not move from where he stood by the fireplace it was on his tongue to say stay here that will make it all right but he did not speak he stood staring at her his face clouded with trouble and sadness in his eyes and susan sat there in the chair about four paces away from him looking down at her hands which she turned about in her lap after a little time she let her hands lie still and put her head back in the corner of the chair and closed her eyes blanchard moved his feet but he did not leave the spot where he stood and then he said thoughtfully as if he were speaking to himself of the impossible if you and i lived together it might be all right he knew quite well that he would never do susan any harm he found it impossible for a reason he could not tell to think what is called sinfully of her nevertheless he had to say what came into his mind although he knew there was no question of it susan looked at him he moved he took his pipe off the mantelpiece and lit it for since susan did not speak there seemed to be no more to do or say his face was clouded with sorrow and tribulation filled his heart but he did not know why he was vexed with pain and unhappiness or what he expected of susan to-night he felt no impulse as he sometimes did to kneel down at her knees and pour out his thoughts he was at a dead end he did not know which way to turn and susan also had no comprehension of anything save utter blankness he was aware next that he was taking her downstairs she refused to allow him to see her home she said it is so terrible being left on the doorstep i'll come in he replied no josephine will be there she answered all right he said and caused her to linger a moment when shall i see you again on wednesday i am afraid i have an engagement on wednesday he took a little book out of his pocket and peered at it in the dim light cast by the lamp i haven't another evening he said let me see this is thursday what about monday at six monday may the thirteenth is that next week yes i will come on monday at six he kissed her here yes she kissed him again or at a quarter two he concluded when susan was out of sight he turned and went upstairs and sat down again on the arm of his chair just as he had done when she was there he was very miserable and unhappy and began slightly to tremble he sighed and became more unhappy and more wretched and felt as if he had been forsaken presently he thought of himself as the innocent victim of women and felt angry women had not the right to interfere with his freedom he sighed an oppressive cloud seemed to be descending upon him which resolved itself into a suspicion that he himself was not quite honest in the same moment he was glad that susan had gone and regretted it was pleased with his own part in the evening's interview and was disgusted with it she needn't see me he thought and tried to fix the responsibility for unhappiness upon her but again he doubted his honesty suddenly he threw himself down on the floor beside the chair on which he had been sitting his heart broke with shame with weariness and anger and bursting into tears partly of self-compassion partly of generous sorrow he bowed his head and wept upon the old chair's breast as if it had been his mother's End of chapter 20, recording by expatriate in Bangor, Maine.